Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Akil, and for today's episode, we cover systems thinking. We go over what it is in the first place and why it's becoming more prevalent as software grows more complex. I invited my guest Diana Montellian on, who's currently dancing with systems over at Mentrix Group. Love that Twitter handle. I'll put the links to her socials in the description below. And with that being said, enjoy the episode. Welcome to Beyond Coding, a dive into the world of successful people in IT. From your sponsors, Zebia, creating digital leaders. Here's your host, Patrick Akil. I love the team mug. <laughs> I, <clears throat> excuse me. I um, I I have a collection. Some of them are gifts, or they yeah. they all have meaning. So every time I make a cup of tea, I get to decide which mug to use and oh. there's always there's always some some good sort of emotional part of it and so yes me too <laughs> how, how many of them do you have then Just to not a lot no probably 20 probably okay. maybe 20 not a lot fits on the, the bottom shelf yeah. but it's just neat to have meaning to feel connected to meaning in the choice and mood you know yeah. i choose different ones depending on my mood or Sometimes to remind myself to stay calm yeah. or whatever the, whatever it is in the day. So. Yeah, that makes sense. It's weird how when we get a gift, I, I hold a lot of value in that gift way more than when I would get something myself. I actually don't really get stuff myself because, I mean, first of all, I don't need a lot of stuff. And when I get a gift, it's, it's the more better, I think. I agree. I agree, yeah. especially with things like like the uh, uh, like a mug for coffee or tea, where every day you experience the connection to yeah. the person that gave it to you. I yeah. think is um, yeah, I I really like that ritual. A friend when she got married had um, as a gift, she said, just bring Christmas ornaments mm. or Christmas trees. And so every year when she puts up her Christmas tree, yeah. she thinks of each and every person that that gave her that. That That's ornament, amazing. and I thought that was a wonderful idea. Yeah, I, I love hearing that. I, I got a water bottle, which is, I mean, it sounds kind of stupid, right? But I drink a lot of water. I don't drink coffee. I sometimes drink tea. Uh, but water is what I drink throughout the day. And I, I love that bottle. I have multiple ones because people gift them to me. Uh, when I met my girlfriend, we were going to date uh, remote. She was moving to London within a month of me meeting her. And I bought her this water bottle. And at first I was like, and who gives a person a water bottle? So I didn't bring it the first time I went. Uh, but the second time I did, I had enough confidence apparently to give it to her. Uh, and she still has that. She says that was one of the best gifts because she had always those kind of shitty plastic ones that you would buy in the store. So yeah, that's my uh, She my, carried my water you bottle. with her all the time. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. 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 So I get that. Some kind of emotional attachment to the, the stuff we get or the stuff we give. Right, exactly. Uh, Exactly. Yeah, this is a lovely way to start the conversation. I feel much more relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can just keep it going from here. I don't need to do a countdown. Right. We're already recording and everything. Uh, so welcome, Diana. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, we already kicked off starting to talk about tea and uh, and water bottles. So we'll just keep it going. <clears throat> I, I invited you on to talk about systems thinking because uh, I think it's getting more and more prevalent as software is getting more and more complex, as our outside world is getting more and more complex in the first place. Uh, but let's start with the systems thinking term. What is systems thinking to you? So it's interesting because I've really wrestled with that phrase. And part of the reason that I have is because it depends on the context in your point of view. So on academia, for example, it's developing a meaning. In technology, it's developing a meaning. In business and even in marketing, it's developing a meaning. Mm. And so um, and so I've really struggled to integrate the different definitions. So I've switched to using nonlinear thinking instead yeah. of systems thinking. Um, because then by then I can bring in things like pattern thinking, right? So when we, when we think about, um, uh, the orchestration in a system or, or event driven or the conversation, the relationship between software, we're often thinking in patterns, mm -hmm. um, 
Edward de Bono, I think he calls it parallel thinking, out of the box thinking. Um, all of these things are part and parcel of what how I would define systems thinking. Okay. Um, but what it, we mean is that when you're thinking more about relationships, patterns, um, uh, the relationship between parts, one of the the one of my favorite words um, uh it on in the subject is emergence, mm. which is when the sum of the parts is more than any individual part could be. That okay. you start having qualities that um, that can only happen because of the and. If you put this and that, you get a third thing that you couldn't have without that relationship. That when you're when you're exploring that, that's what I would call systems thinking. Yeah. I mean, I, if I take it back to software, right, if I put stuff together, sometimes I have a side effect. I have this byproduct, which I can't really explain. But when you dive into that, when this happens in combination with something else, this kind of byproduct happens that none of us could foresee. But I see it happening more and more, right, because we're attaching a lot of stuff. There's a lot of integrations. Even when you're isolated, you still need multiple moving parts within your application. And you're not going to build. We reuse, actually a lot of software. I mean, we still build a lot, but we reuse a lot as well, which is great. Uh, but then kind of those byproducts happen. When you say linear thinking, I'm, I should think about really just cause and effect, I guess, in kind of a straight line. Well, so it's really tricky because mm. um, we're so conditioned by linear thinking or linear thinking patterns that usually whenever we talk about thinking, it's what we mean. Yeah. And so, for example, this this ability to break down a problem into steps and then solve those steps towards a goal, that's a linear approach to. Yeah. And we use that in software all the time. It's really valuable. Um, a lot of a lot of science is based on linear approaches. Usually yeah. when we engage the word concrete, we mean linear when we say we yeah. want concrete um, thinking or smart goals and linear thinking isn't separate from nonlinear thinking. It's just not the container, yeah. right? So when we talk about systems thinking or nonlinear thinking, then it contains linear thinking, but it is not defined by it. Yeah. So when you compared it to software, so for example, because I, most of my, um, career experience has been in information systems and in content. So, the shift, we would install a piece of software and we would expand it and expand it and expand it and expand it and add yeah. caching. But the um, the software was predominantly triggered by a page view request or mm. a, a request for the information. But as we've moved towards um, towards a source of information, maybe where editors work yeah. and and pr um, providing it, so for example, through GraphQL, where you can in any time, right, more asynchronous choreography, in any time you can request information in multiple different re types of requesters, yeah. you know, not just a web page is requesting it. That's when you, we start to see a lot of emergence because then there's all kinds of things we can do that we couldn't do before. Yeah. Um, right, pushing and pulling information, um, the 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 timing of what it means for something to be published or ready or shared, like that's that's when you're still using software, but the relationships that you're designing now open up opportunities that weren't necessarily there before. Yeah, I like I like the example of GraphQL, right? Because if you compare it to normal REST APIs. Uh, it's a bit more defined what can happen within a REST API, right? You have this type of request and you only have these types of responses. Whereas with GraphQL, your request can be a lot of different things, right? Because it's available for you, the data to query. And then the response is based on what you actually ask uh, of the GraphQL API. I think it's because things are moving faster and faster that we want more different types of information or it's a different way of conveying that information or making it available to the outside world. I think it's getting more complex that way as well, but it's, it's getting a lot interesting as well. 
Yeah. So from my point of view, I, oh, this is so. This is one of my favorite subjects. So I'm um, happy to dive into <laughs> this. But um, so what happened? It used to be, in you know, years ago. In my work, we you'd build a house, a, a digital space, a website. Um, everybody did. So the New York Times and the Economist and any, anywhere that anywhere that you went, Amazon, it's going over to someone else's house and having an experience. And everything was really designed for that. Yeah. But now people want information in the context they're in. So it, you know what? It, it, that's not just what device they're on, but also they're on different platforms and or in in Facebook or in Twitter and interacting with it. But also, depending on the context they're in, they want different priority of information. So restaurants is a great example. Mm -hmm. Usually, if I'm sitting here at my desk looking at, for information about a restaurant in New York City, I usually want to see the menu and how to make a reservation. Yeah. But when I look at the same information when I'm on the street in Manhattan, I want directions. Yeah. Where are you? Because usually I'm on my way. And so this idea of this that, that now our way of communicating is a giant graph. Yeah. And that we want to mix and match information depending on the context that we're in and we want to prioritize differently presents this truly delightful challenge to yeah. um, to systems design, like really just infinitely interesting. Exactly. I love the restaurant example because, I mean, before you laid out systems thinking can have linear thinking within it, right? Because it's more of an overarching, I mean, it's a system anyway. Uh, but with the restaurant example, it's one way when you're at home, very linear, what information you want to have and what you're looking for. And then on the street, it's completely different. Probably in a different city, you're going to look at reviews. Um, you have all of these use cases now. And somehow when we're building new software, we need to accommodate for those or even think about what we have and then accommodate for that, which makes it infinitely more complex if we just had a few use cases, right? But right. because we even have use cases, which we can't even think of, I think we just need to incrementally keep going and discover and implement, basically. I think that's the only way. Yeah, and it, it's it's so so that the challenge with systems thinking with with nonlinear thinking is that out of the box we're truly terrible at it, mm. like, and and we're not helped by the fact that we tend to be educated in a linear model, yeah. and so we we really and, and more than that we all of our own cognitive biases and logical fallacies and all of they seem very real to us yeah. and and we have to cultivate a lot of self-awareness to become aware of how our own thinking gets hijacked by our own preconditioned thinking yeah. and the paradox is that in order to see that we have to actually be good at nonlinear thinking <laughs> to, in order to see that we're not good at nonlinear thinking. And so it's um, if the way that I've um, been writing and, and teaching about it is that it's a practice, right? Mm. It's not you can't it's not like JavaScript where you can go to training and then start, you know, and you're writing code. And it's more of a um, um, some principles and some patterns, just like in systems. We are the system. That yep. we will build, right? And so we have to adopt ways of working with our own patterns and um, find the the counterintuitive ways that we're operating that we don't really see yep. in order for us to get better at um, building systems of software. And what happens, which is fine, it's totally fine, but I've seen this again and again, where teams will... Um, go from monolith to microservices, right? Yeah. So this is really common in my part of the technology world um, because that's what information systems are doing, right? So the team goes from monolith to microservices and then discover they have the same linear patterns in their microservices that they yeah. had in the original software. Um, and that's because that's only so, we could only change our thinking patterns so much yeah. in order to build the microservices. And that's fine because V2 gets more asynchronous and less linear. And so it, it's one of the things that we, it's not, there's no real lift and shift change from linear 
uh, processes to nonlinear processes. It's an yeah. iterative practice of um, designing patterns, but also changing our own approaches in our yeah. own ways of, of um, deciding what to do as we have more and more experience in more and more complexity. Yeah. I feel like for myself, for kind of my personal journey, I was very much focused on kind of me and the thing, the tasks I needed to do, right? And as I got more comfortable with that, you move towards the team. And as you get more comfortable with that, you move towards, wait, what am I actually doing? What are we as a team actually doing? And I come from an operations background. So looking at different applications that are connected to each other, uh, sometimes linearly, sometimes in parallel, uh, that's how I kind of got started in the adult workspace. Uh, so then when I transitioned into software, that kind of always stuck with me being that, okay, this is coming from a certain source. Then we kind of implement something and then it's going to X, Y, and Z party. Uh, but zooming out, I think that really just helps when you're good and comfortable in what you're doing, zoom out a bit more towards your probably direct sphere of influence, your team and on their sphere of influence, maybe other teams or parts of organizations to get an understanding of the system that you operate within, right? Not even on a software space, uh, but even on a business level, right? When a client actually has a problem, how does that get to you and how does that get to the software, right? And if that is, has millions of hops in between it, then do you actually know if you know your customer or did you get some kind of version of that story in the first place? Yeah, it's so for me, the um, the most the most essential initial practice. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's really the first thing I started talking about is is in a single artifact that describes a task. So, you yeah. know what your task is. Do you know why it matters? Yeah. Like, do you know why to the mission that you are serving this matters? And it's interesting because there's a lot of resistance to keeping that cohesion. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, I have experienced it from the product people. Oh, I, we don't need, we just need the, you know, we don't need to explain what we just, exactly. I just want them to do what I'm asking them to do. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, yeah, we're not going to proceed that way. <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, that's nice for you, dear. I know that yeah. that's what you, that's what it is that you want, but we can't create, um, Code is, a, is just a language and a system speaks a coding language and people speak a, you know, English or German or whatever it is that they're speaking yeah. and that we can we can synergize those languages better if we stay connected to the why. And so it's really important that when I'm when I'm building something in my little piece of the system, I also really do understand how this is going to um benefit yeah. the, the, the mission, the system as a whole and the mission that, that we're serving. And that's not really a, um, a tricky or time consuming thing to do, but yeah. it does go against a lot of the way that we organize ourselves to get work done. Right. Yeah. And so, um, so it really, this is the biggest challenge. It's kind of like, uh, when people adopt agile, but they still have a waterfall structure, <laughs> <laughs> but and they put agile inside, right? Yeah. Then that that I mean it works a bit, but it's it's gonna push against the container. So exactly. it's the same thing with systems thinking and 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 bringing uh, people's people together to to work together towards a healthier system, a more robust system, one that has better relationships and create. Um, emergence in that system, yeah. you have to start with exactly how you said the task level, like improving the way we think about the, when we, we move from thinking about investing an hour or finishing a JIRA ticket. And yeah. we begin to think, how are we investing our time, energy, and attention? Where am I putting my energy and my attention in order to move this the software, the system, or the infrastructure that contains it so that it um, is growing, yeah. right? It's growing. The whole ecosystem is growing. And it, it requires often a change in the way that we lead as well yeah. as in the way that we code. Exactly. It, it kind of makes me sad that some people don't get that dialogue, right? That understanding of why are we, why are we doing this or why are we within a team doing this, right? What, what, goal can does it contribute to 
which just makes me sad because first of all, there's not a lot of engineers. There's millions of job positions, not enough engineers to fill them. So then when you actually are within an organization and want to be effective, if you don't get that information, if you don't get that dialogue, then it's just a waste because probably you're going to make some assumptions. Not all of them are going to be correct. Why? You're going to hit a strike now and then, and you are going to be correct. But with misinformation or lack of information, you're also going to make mistakes. And those mistakes are not going to be bad, but they could have been prevented by just receiving the information and, and really just having that dialogue. It really makes me sad that within some organizations, apparently you don't get that, which was a, yeah. a strange realization. Yeah, for me, I confess it's, it's a very geeky confession, but it makes me system sad, too, mm. because of Conway's law that, you know, the way that an organization structures communication is yeah. exactly the way that their technology will be structured. If you want to see how an organization operates, you just look at the code yeah. and how the relationships in the code happen. Right. So if you have an organization that that um wants to have a healthy system and to have um, benefits like you're saying, like you were saying, right, that there's a byproducts that they didn't even expect, like they get, you get more than you give when you have yeah. a really good, healthy technology system. But if you don't have that exact same thing in the people yeah. and the way that the people interact, you won't get that in a system. So it, it, it just, um, it limits what we can do as technologists. It limits our ability to build and design things that, that matter and are useful and that grow. And, and, and that's sad to me because I, I like to see beautiful systems, right? Yeah. It, and so they go, it, it, it's sort of like watching someone make a decision in their life that you know is really going to limit them. Like it's not... Uh great for them and they're going to suffer the consequences of that. I, I feel like that about systems too. Yeah, I get that. It, it's, I mean, it still baffles my mind. I don't understand why that dialogue can't happen, right? It's something in the, maybe even the people, the culture or the organization. I, I can't put a finger on it, but I hear more and more that sometimes the dialogue just doesn't happen or the technical side of the operation doesn't have a seat at the table when Decisions get made, for example, which is just, I mean, it's the basic element, right? You grow up with it, communicate whatever you want, together we'll make it happen. That's basically what my parents said. We can always have a dialogue, right? And I can be incorrect or I can be correct, right? Depending on my age and uh, how much I know about a certain topic. Uh, but there's always a dialogue. There's always an understanding, or at least from one side trying to explain uh, for the other side trying to understand. And somehow right. some it, we don't, give the same time and attention within an organization, which is just odd to me. So it's really interesting you're saying this. I had not thought of this before, but the um, that that is essential to system thinking. Like you can't mm. you can't do systems or nonlinear thinking without what you're talking about. Yeah. And that's the way I raised my son too. The so if I say no you can ask why you can we can you can ask why because yeah. you it's right to have a discussion about it you can't keep whying why 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 what that's not like no. yeah, <laughs> there will exactly. come a time in which i said no and that's why yeah. i said no because i said no um but when he went to college and then um he it was in a philosophy class and he called me and he's like mom the, some of the other student they can't think and this mm. is what he meant. Wit and my son is now a, a microservices engineer, right? <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprisingly, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, but I, it's this this ability to have self aware dialogue, not mm. just delegation delegation dialogue. That's not yeah. what I mean, right? Self aware dialogue. One of the things for me that I, I really lucked out earlier in my career, I was on some really good teams um, yeah. communication wise and um, and the role of the product owner, the role of the technical lead, the role of the people on the team and the role of the scrum master was all about this communication. And rather than delegation, what it was is so at the end of the day, the product yeah. owner is going to be ultimately responsible for delivering the value. And yeah. so if the product owner would suggest something and 
technically I thought it was a crazy, not good idea, right? Like just, no, I would say that and we would have a discussion, but in the end, he or she would make the final decision and I would respect it. And that's what I would do because I'm not the one who's going to, um, uh, you know, I'm not the one who carries the responsibility, but the same with the tech, like the product owner could say, well, I think maybe this or that, and I would still make the the final decision. Yeah. And so I carry that into my career. And I think this is why I eventually became a systems architect, right? And working at the enterprise level, because it, it is all about communication. And it's funny because, um, I, I'm, I'm on sabbatical now writing a book and, and the, I ended up throwing away what I was doing and starting all over again. Yeah. And when I started all over again, I realized, you know, I was deciding between writing, acting, teaching the things I was doing before and yeah. writing code and going in technology. And I made this big binary decision. Mm. And now it's like it wasn't a it was a fake decision. Technology is communication. Exactly. And communication is like, like there's no diver, there's no my my role is predominantly structuring thinking. Yep. And how is that really different from other kinds of roles that structure thinking, right? Exactly. So, it's it's the same thing within a different jacket or or different challenges, I guess. I mean, the more and more I talk to first of all everyone that I've had as a guest on the show, also the future guests I'm going to have, uh, the more I realize that the technical problems are actually quite easy, right? If you break it down, if you go back to school and you think about the theory, you think about an isolated problem, you can solve that problem because that makes it very linear, right? But everything around it, connecting it to other pieces of software, other teams and the communication around it, the more human side, that is actually what we're struggling with. That is actually quite hard, right? How do you fit that? within kind of the overarching organization and the structure and the culture and the hierarchy there, and then still be effective, that makes it a lot more difficult all of a sudden. Yeah. And it, so this, uh, this way be dragons, but it's a dragon day. So I'm going to (laughs) go, I'm going to say the dragon day part. So, um, so there are a number of things. So empathy, for example, Yeah. when you talk about, the why and knowing the why, right? This requires a putting yourself in the shoes of the people that are going to use what you're building or experience what you're building, um, which is one way of of describing empathy. And then I've mentioned self-awareness, right? Mm -hmm. That you need to become aware of your own thinking. And I would also add um, friendliness, what I call meta, right? So this this ability to when you if you and I are working together and you share your idea that I see my role as um, engaging with you to see if we can strengthen it. Like, can we can we add more good reason behind what you're thinking? Right. So yep. it's a yes and which I learned from acting and improv. It's an improv rule. Right. Mm. You always say yes and you go with it. Right. Well, tech is a huge no culture. Like, <laughs> no, 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 no. Right. No. Oh. Yeah. Someone is wrong on the internet, like, exactly. <laughs> like right? Yeah. And myself, and myself in, included. Hmm. And so recently, I um, so while I've been on sabbatical and writing the book, and pandemic, and um, colleagues at war, all these things that are going on, I went on retreat in which I was doing a lot of movement and a lot of self-awareness work and a lot of sort of rebalancing emotionally, right? So I stop reacting to everything and regain the ability to respond to things. So what's interesting in my daily life is greater than 90% of the people I work with or when I'm teaching or speaking are men. And on this retreat, greater than 90% of the people were women. And so it's like having a foot in these two worlds where we value one aspect of skill. uh, Intuition is a big one. I don't know how people work in this industry, especially as complexity increases without some intuition. Like you just kind of know, right? And and systems are very counterintuitive. Our intuition leads us in the wrong direction. So we even have to learn how to trust and distrust our intuition. And so I was thinking at the end of this retreat, like, 
we need to cultivate experiences that bring those two worlds together, right? So that a whiteboard test is not going to show you how people think about relationships, but systems are only relationships. It's an old, I can be the best JavaScript programmer in the world and still be terrible at nonlinear thinking. And so you have people that we're, we're even saying in order to be worthy or valuable, you have to be good at linear skills and we, yeah. and the, the others are soft skills. Uh, I have a colleague that I really respect and he started to call them core skills and he said, oh, it's really? been going fine since he did that. But for me, I think it's the, um, we have a cultural bias towards what it means to be someone good at tech and that bias yeah. leans in the direction of a particular gender and particular race. And, and there is nothing about, gender that makes one able to javascript exactly yeah and so but we don't the tricky part is that when we open up this can of worms like it gets messy right away (laughs) because it really isn't about gender a lot of men suffer the same kinds of things a lot of women agree with it like it's not it's a very complex thing but mostly it's just a way that we've we've not merged the different skill sets that are involved in thinking yeah. And found a way to describe them in a somewhat non-binary way, right? Exactly. So, and we need to. We need to, yeah. given pandemic and climate crisis and war and all of the, in the the fact that our information systems are so vulnerable to abuse. Yeah. We need to learn to bring different types of skill sets than what we think of as IT skills together, or we won't. We won't. I mean, who we won't where we won't get better systems. I don't know. Exactly. I don't know whether we survive as a species or not. That's a whole nother discussion. But we won't get better systems. We'll get the same systems that we already have in different forms. Yeah, it feels like a never-ending circle at some point because somehow you need some intervention, right? But yeah. the people that are going to make the change, so new people can be brought in, right, with different sets of skills. You already need those decisions being made uh, at the top level, at the people on the inside. I feel like if you're following a bachelor's degree, computer science probably, I haven't followed computer science myself, uh, but a lot of the skills I'm assuming you get taught there uh, is execution mode, right? Solving an isolated problem, solving some algorithm, solving some complexity issue, something like that, I'm assuming. Uh, But I've also seen it in hiring, right? do this kind of code lead hacker rank challenge, uh, solve these issues before you even have a dialogue, right? And before then, I'm just talking to an automated email system that says, all right, thank you for your application. Do this uh, uh, hacker rank kind of challenge. If you pass, then you get a person on the other end, which is so strange. And then they start still looking at very technical skills. But then, first of all, the culture fit happens. So you already need a technical bar that you need to kind of reach before you can do that culture fit. Then you can see, okay, is this a good match on an organizational level? Then your questions even get asked and hopefully answered. Um, But the bar is so high to get that conversation nowadays, which is so strange. I do see it changing though, more and more. That conversation number one is just a culture fit. Uh, And then it's a dialogue more about technology and everything around it rather than the actual execution solving an isolated problem. Uh, and therefore, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that we're at least moving in the right direction. So it's interesting. I, this is, this is um, um, we're hitting all my favorite subjects. And it's very fun. <laughs> that, um, so the, some of the best hires that I've ever had, ever done in my yeah. career, the people that I hired did not have the technical expertise in, yeah. the, in the software that we were working in because they learned that and they learned it fast because that's what we do, right? I mean, whatever, sk- the skill set that I started with, what I, what I was coding when I started, I don't code that. It, like, that's not what I yeah. do anymore. They, no. I, there's so many constant skills. Um, so I, I do think sometimes that's a pro- Sometimes you need someone who, who does already. So I'm not saying that that's a universal, doesn't matter if people have technical knowledge. Yeah. It does matter for sure. But I've had great success not prioritizing that. So it is very encouraging. And I've never seen it fail. People learn or they don't. That's what kind of, that's what we do. Yeah. But 
the way that the, the way that I ha- the way I think it's been most successful, at least for me, and then partly because it matches my style, is that someone comes in, they bring people from the team, and someone comes in with a problem that they solved, right? Yeah. And they walk us through it. Like they walk us through, here's the code, here was the problem, here's how I understood it. And that if 20 minutes later we forgot that this is an interview and instead yeah. we're just all talking about this problem and, you know, the, those other engineers were, were asking like, oh, well, why did you do this? We've had that in the past. Oh, you, oh, and you, and then, then, then what else do you need really? Yeah. Like then we're going to continue to solve problems together and be able to work it out and be able to think well together. And that's, that's mostly, um, it's mostly what I, what we do, right? At least for me, that's what mostly what I've done and what, what I've done with teams and, and the, the, in, there's an interesting quirk and it's kind of embarrassing to say, I'm, I'm, it's funny cause I feel a bit embarrassed to say it, but it's true. It's an interesting quirk is that I've worked my entire career. I have never not worked. I have always had the next thing has always come and the next thing has always come. And I, I make, um, a lot more now than I did when I <laughs> built my first Drupal site for a local YWCA <laughs> yeah, <that's good. laughs> many, many, <laughs> many years ago. Um, and so, um, so it's, I, in that way, it felt very successful. I have never been hired through a traditional hiring route. Okay. That, that I haven't done that very often because yeah. usually the next thing comes along and the next thing comes along. But a few times in my career, I have done the, like, met someone who's like, Oh, we're looking for this and submit your yeah. resume. And, and I, that, it's never led to a job that, that way. And I, it could be me. It might be me, yeah. but I think it also says something about, because the, I mean, I've been really successful for some of the same companies later when I came in a different way. Yeah, exactly. And do you think, I mean, you are probably on the inside. Do they still do those traditional hires? Because this is more of a, we already know you or you start with a dialogue, right? Do other people yeah. get that same treatment when they come in? So I think some people are just good also at the way that we, um, that we, at the, at that structure, they're just really yeah. good at it. So I think a lot of people who, um, you know, are great to work with, um, terrific to work with do fine in that structure and they get hired. Yeah. Um, but I know a lot of people who are uh, more glue roll people, right, which would be the systems thinkers, right, the nonlinear yeah. thinkers. A lot of people have had really dehumanizing experiences in companies that everybody would know and think are awesome to work with. Yeah. Um, in fact, they found it just humiliating, really. So I think it's kind of it's like public education, like not every 12 year old is. Yeah working at the same level in every subject, really. Yeah. So we we have a linear model and some people happen to fit really well in that linear model and some people don't. And we don't question the model. I have seen in my career, and maybe it's just the, the, the environments I've ended up, I've yeah. seen more whiteboard testing as a way of hiring now than I did okay. say 10 years ago. And I, I'm concerned about that trend and not to say a black or white, yes or no, good or bad. But I do think that, um, this taskmaster, um, but this brings up a whole nother subject of communication in a hierarchy and, yeah. and nothing brings out our, our, um, our ego structure, like hiring, right? Yeah. Like we like, we like that a lot of us, mm. a lot of us do, right? We sort of like that. Um, it, it, some of it feels like hazing to me, like yeah. we're all applying to a fraternity and we have yeah. to get through this hazing in order. And that isn't um, partnering for, for progress. That isn't um, collective reasoning and collaboration and the kinds of things we need for systems. Yeah. So I think one of the challenges is as soon as we get this, um, this power aspect yeah. playing a role, um, then it's like Schrodinger's cat, right? We're looking in the box and we change the result. So yeah. we're, we're, we're making it really super messy. Hmm. Um, it, and it's also, interesting that you it, say that. I'm sorry. 
No worries. Mm-hmm. It's it's interesting that you say that because I recognize that. I, I I got hired when I was, I think, 21. And then at 22, I needed to do an interview. But I was the, not the interviewee, I was the interviewer, which to me was weird because the person sitting across from me was probably in their 30s or 40s. And I had a resume and I needed to ask questions. Right. Already in my mind, there was some kind of weirdness here because there is some, I mean, it was weird interviewing someone that was older than me, uh, even though they had probably far more, uh, way more experience than I had, obviously in different areas, but still somehow it's shifted. And I hadn't realized that until you said it, but now it's just a dialogue, right? I start with the conversation with, listen, we're equals. This needs to be a win-win. So we're also going to have that communication, that dialogue as equals, right? Because in a team, that's already there. As soon as we hire you, we're one in the same, within the same team, basically. Uh, and that's how we should treat each other. I don't know for myself when it shifted, when it didn't become this weird hierarchy thing, when it just became kind of an equal level of communication. But I'm happy I realized that now, and I think it changed for the better, actually, yeah. Yeah, and there's a difference between judgment and discernment. Yeah. Right. That we are we have to discern. We don't have to make a choice here. Right. And there's some discernment that goes with the choice. But that mm. doesn't have to be judgment or disrespect or any of that. And and also we we of so many of our own biases get in the way yeah. and in tech they're re- reinforcing. So you were telling you were talking about um computer science. So for me, I went to my mentor um, after the second year and I said, this isn't work for me. I said, I just took a final exam where yep. the person who we, we all wrote code and the code fought against each other. And the last man standing got the A. This is not <laughs> academically interesting exactly. an outcome yeah. to me. I said, I feel like I'm in a room full of Tonka toys and Legos. And these and I like those toys, but that's all, that's not what I'm trying to do in the world. Right. Yeah. And he said, and he was the reason he was my, my professor, mentor, whatever the right word is, is because his class is terrific. It's what got me into computer, into programming in the first place. And he yeah. said, he said, I wholeheartedly agree, Diana, I wholeheartedly agree. And I want to hire more diverse professors. But in order for me to do that, more women have to stay and get a PhD which means we have to go through the gauntlet of how things are. And he said, the thing that you don't know, though, he said, yes, we've got these whiz kids. And I was 35 when I learned to code. Like I didn't, I had a whole life before I went into tech. And so, and he, he said, he said, he said, the thing you don't know, though, is you're who business wants. He said that basically what you're saying, he didn't say it this way, but it's what you're saying. It's the ability to have these strategic conversations. It's the ability yeah. to think this way, that you've got these whiz kids with this incredible tech skill, but that's only part of the equation. And I was getting A's, so it's not like I was struggling to write the code, but yeah. I was struggling with the um with the the culture the structure of the work and the yeah. way, what we thought was winning what what the other people what the other students thought was winning is not what felt like winning for me yeah um and so that that has been a uh, a career long challenge and i have worked with many many people and of course almost all of them men who have been instrumental in my ability to do what I do. I've had yeah. people throw me into Im- seemingly impossible challenges and trust me to code my way out of it. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely not, um, you know, it's not a duality and yeah. that there's a lot of, um, of complexity here. But again, when in the program that I was in, it was reinforcing a set of cultural values, of communication values, of of all kinds of things that didn't fit me and didn't have anything to do with whether or not I should continue in the career. And yeah. that happens in almost every organization and especially around hiring. Yeah. Right. We make assumptions that other people will think like we think. And so we're testing to see if they think as long as we're testing to see, do you think like I think? Because that's what counts. Yeah. We'll have no diversity. Exactly. And if we have no diversity, we'll have no systems. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Right. On the other hand, wait, 
on top of that, we need both, right? You still need people that are the glue, as you mentioned it, right? That are great at communicating, great at deriving, okay, where's the value? Challenging the product owner, for example, challenging the stakeholders in a way as well. And with that technical knowledge that can still execute, but that might be better at gluing things together when it comes to dialogue and communication. And then on the other hand, people that can execute, when you give them a problem, they have X ways of solving it, and they choose probably the right one, the most scalable one, the most effective one, depending on what the environment asks of them, right? If it's time, they can be the fastest possible. If it's quality, they can build the best quality service. Uh, but you need both, probably within the same people, uh, but people are not necessarily equal, right? You can have your preferences. You can tip that scale a bit more towards glue or tip that scale a bit more towards execution. Um, I just think the whiteboard and the execution side is so well defined because that's way more linear thinking, way more, okay, we have, a, we have a problem, solve it, we'll see how you do it. And we'll have a dialogue along the way. Whereas the glue side is not as refined, I guess. It's, it's more soft. That's why it's probably called soft skills. And that also makes it harder to test, right? Harder to make it quantifiable if the person I'm talking to actually has that or is maybe faking it or is maybe just really good at storytelling because that also helps if you're great at storytelling. Uh, but maybe they don't know, it's hard to measure if you can actually execute that within the current organization because it has a lot more factors going against it, I think, as well. Maybe that's why okay. the whiteboard is just way more out there, way more tested in that way as well. Yeah, and it, and again, linear thinking is what we think is thinking. So yeah. we, you know, there's a lot of reinforcement for that. And this is why the practicing pattern, pattern thinking, uh, parallel thinking, these things are really helpful. Also, empathy, communication, yeah. self-awareness, uh, it being embodied that, you know, we, we, uh, most of our reactions to things are not going to help. Right. Yeah. It, we need to be able to respond, which means that we need to be able to process what we're hearing from other people and synthesize it with our own yeah. knowledge and judgment. We need to proactively, um, proactively get other other people's experience and yeah. blend it with our own. And so these are real skills that you can practice if we're willing to think of them as IT skills. And yeah. the better we get at that, the more we'll develop something a little you know, it won't be a whiteboard test, but it'll become more apparent to us if someone yeah. has has cultivated that um, that skill set. And there was something you said that was very provocative. Um, I wanted to respond to it. Oh, darn, that's gone <laughs> out of my I was talking head. about kind of the glue and the execution, more tipping the scale uh -huh. and how we yes. need both. Yes, because this is the star. Like to me, this is the 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 highlight of 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 at least for me the most valuable lesson that I've learned, and that is partnership. Mm. So a long time ago, I was um, lead on a team, and there was some discussion about whether other teams needed lead or the role of leadership. And bless their hearts, when the question came up of what lead was, someone said, "Oh, it's team secretary." Mm. <laughs> well, there's a pretty loaded word right there. Yeah, exactly. But, also, but like, like, you know, like I don't want to have to be doing the communication. So first yeah. I learned that I was doing the communication because my teammates didn't value it. And so that was a really important lesson to learn, right? Because yeah. I was just going to play Wendy um, in the Island of Lost Boys for my entire career if I did not realize that. Um, I need, I needed to not overcompensate in that way, yeah. but also another engineer who was terrific. And I still, still one of the best ones that I've, I've worked with. He said, well, Diana, I, I want, I just want my code to speak for me, hmm. like, but your code doesn't speak, speak, exactly. like literally doesn't speak. So I stopped doing the communication and the team had two zero point sprints yeah. because there was so much happening there that made the code deliverable. But what came out of that is that he and I, right, code speak for me and me, we figured out that together we are better than the sum of our parts. And he's the person I always want, like exactly what you're saying, the the execution, the like, no matter how good my code or my my architecture is, he's going to yeah. make it better. Right. Conversely, 
I think I'm great at business language. I, yeah. I'm, I speak normal. I'm, I'm not like a super geek. I speak normal. Oh, yeah. Until I try and do it. And then people like they have pointed back <laughs> in my career. They're like, reread that paragraph, Diana, and take out all the tech speak in that paragraph. And I have to get rid of half of it because I still <laughs> that's how I talk. Right. Yeah. So I think I'm good at it and I'm not. So I partner with people who are good at it. And yeah. together we um, one of my favorite partners was um, he was head of graphics. Right. So he's he was a speaks a very visual language. And I do not even though I'm an architect, it's really weird because I have mm. to make models and speak visually. But it's I've had to really practice that skill. I was not born with it. Yeah. But I, it's also because I learned from him, like just basics like Diana, there's no key. Mm. There's no key on this picture that you've made what do any of these symbols make? <laughs> but we don't need keys when we talk engineer to engineer because yeah. we know what we mean right exactly. or we presume we do but as soon as you talk to people who don't speak our language they don't know what it means yeah. so this this that a team is not a silo like we love this hero individual thing but if you really want to build complex interesting, matterful systems. It's about the synergy of bringing people together who can blend their strengths and yeah. compensate well for their their challenges so that you have exactly what you're saying, the execution, a strong, strong execution, and also the willingness to always be learning. Like, yeah. It, it it's hard for me to go into a team, which I've been recently with a team, they're brilliant they're brilliant and i'm supposed to be contributing but i'm learning as more often than i'm actually offering something valuable and that's how it should be that's yep. exactly how it should be um and if if we don't if we're not if that's not how we view relationships within yeah. technology teams or between the teams or in leadership, then we're really, again, it makes me systems sad, yeah. right? We're, we're going to limit our ability to create something that's better than any one of us could create alone. Yeah. I mean, even within that team, right? You could call it a system because if you partner up, if you really synergize, then you're going to create that byproduct we're talking about. Right, all of a sudden right. a dialogue is going to happen and we're going to realize together uh, that actually, oh, we could also do this. We don't just have A and B, which I thought I had A, you thought you had B. Oh, there's an option C because we had that dialogue. Um, and you can be that well-oiled machine that a team should be. Right? You can't do it all. I used to think if I multiply myself and I was in a team of Patrick's, oh, we get stuff done. I, I <laughs> luckily now realize that's actually not the case. I'm actually... Not as good at a lot of things that still are required, right? But that's where we synergize. And we can synergize best by having diverse backgrounds, diverse people within that same team and knowing and having that dialogue uh, what each other is actually good at, what their preferences are, what we can help them win, or how we can still th share that knowledge, right? Because I still want to know the things I don't know that other people are better at, right? You're never going to stop learning. Uh, and I think the only thing you need there is just the hunger to keep learning um, yeah, and be better and that, because of it. Right. And that, and then you get to the next level, right? Which is now for me, when I make an artifact, so an artifact can be anything really, yeah. any way that I'm structuring thinking to share, right. To, for people to give feedback or to see basically to show if we've come to a conclusion then I want to show how we came to that conclusion. What are the reasons that support? If I'm saying, here's an action I recommend. Yeah. Here are the, the strong reasons why I recommend this action. And also some of the risks and, and weaknesses. And in, so in order for me to make a recommendation that is sound, right, that I is trustworthy, it might not be right, yeah. but it's sound and it's trustworthy, is I have to go find the people who don't think we should do that and exactly. understand why they don't and then discern. So does that change? Does that change uh, the way the, the argument that I'm making, right? That I'm the conclusion that I've come to. And if it doesn't, then I need to handle it to say, this is a point of view and it's a valid point of view. And yeah. here's why I'm not I'm not flowing with that point of view. Like here exactly. are the trade-offs because we think 
Oh, do we think it? Oh, we think we think there's a right and a wrong. Yeah. We lo- and I love it. Like at being at a conference <laughs> and debating like how you do configuration management in a piece of software at two o'clock yeah. in the morning is one of my favorite things to do. I'm never up at two in the morning unless I'm at a conference. Something I've missed so much at COVID is our debating yeah. things as if there's a right and a wrong answer. But there isn't. There's only in the context that we're in, this is the best possible solution we could come up with together yeah. by thinking together and also outside of our own little bubble. And we've come up with, and so then we're going to try it and we're going to see what happens. And yeah. if we're wrong, then we're going to learn. Right. Exactly. And that's not that. Again, this is where the root of linear thinking, concrete, right or wrong, yes or no, show me how this is delivered, you know, break this down, show me how it's deliverable. Um, uh, uh, the, you're too abstract. You're too abstract. That's, <laughs> every, That's the whole point. Thing, we build yeah. what we think. So if exactly. we can't improve what we think, we can't improve what we build. And so we, uh, this, the, you know, people say about, well, concrete, concrete. So if you have an architect that shows up on a piece of property and immediately says, pour concrete over there, that's not what you want <laughs> from that role, right? You want some yeah. discernment because once that concrete is, is poured, that's where the house is going to go, right? Yeah. So the same thing with software. And there's a, um, I even... There's an endless discussion about the word architect and the role architect and engineer versus team versus blah, blah, blah. And, <laughs> and oh, sometimes I find it offensive and sometimes I find it tedious and sometimes I find it incredibly interesting and energizing. It really depends on my mood and also the where the conversation is going. Yeah. Um, I was at speaking once sitting at a table at, at lunch and some um, young man sat down next and he saw that, you know, I was a speaker and architect and he's like, Oh, you're an architect. I want to be an architect too. But I yeah. don't know enough of Kubernetes yet. Oops. Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. at that conference, most of the other speaker, most of us were constantly engaged in that discussion. Okay. Is it a senior technologist? Or is it, and then a lot of people hate it because it's another hierarchy role, which I don't yeah. know how any architect it, it succeeds in that. I need yeah. my teammates educating me like exactly. in order to succeed. So I can't, and besides, I don't, like, who are they working with? I never worked with a team that wants me to tell them what to do. Yeah. Like, that would never have worked for me. Like, they wouldn't have done it. Like, it had to be co- collision. But what I mean is that someone has to, be the voice and thinking about the system as a whole, how the patterns and how the parts come together so that some of us can focus more deeply. Some of us can focus more broadly. Some of us can focus on business. Like, like, so again, it's a synergy, but it is the one who is going to champion nonlinear thinking and nonlinear approaches and structural challenges and tweak the abstract so yeah. that the abstract is sound and um, and and strong and well synthesized. Exactly. And I don't think everybody has to do that, but everybody does do that. Like it's not it's not either or it's not that I don't code. It's yeah. not, though, mostly I don't because there's too much complexity for me to stay constantly engaged. But I do, I do, I still do that. But that's not really the point. Like it's the, yeah. the point is about we're all actually building the same thing. Yeah. Who are you speaking for? What are, what's your point of view that you're contributing and what are the different points of view that are necessary in order for us to have sound reasoning so that when we build something, we can be pretty sure that we've made a good guess and it's always exactly. a guess. Yeah. And it's all about kind of getting that shared understanding, right? Because within that team, it's great if everyone understands it to the same degree, right? That's not necessarily required, that would be great, but you only need to understand it to a certain degree. And then from a role of an architect, that's how I see it, right? They probably understand it more or better uh, than the teammates, right? Because they are more involved within that. They're also thinking about communicating that to the business more so than the people that are executing within that team. Um, so it's a synergy. It's relying on other people for certain skills. Um, and that makes the team actually a team at the end of the day, 
when they can rely on each other, learn from each other, uh, and execute to the best a team can. Yeah, and being open to flexibility. That yeah. like I've had a number of different <clears throat> titles. CEO was my title once in a really? in a in a startup. Like it it depends on the context that you're in. Yeah. What you're gonna speak for, like what you're gonna speak for, and then what you call yourself. Um, aligns with that. So it, yeah. it, um, you know, I, at the end of the day, I think probably in my heart of hearts, engineer is always going to be my favorite, um, yeah. my favorite, but it is, it is, um, I, um, someone I've learned so much from is an expert in, in, in knowledge system, knowledge management, wisdom, like how we cultivate wisdom through knowledge management and has worked with m some of the very biggest, um, biggest brands and yeah. he he said you know if you're saying knowledge management or information and people aren't that that's you're getting tripped up on that don't call yeah. it that <laughs> just don't just practice the principles and i find this with agile i find this with architect like we get a bit hung up and people have um had bad experiences and then they think that's the thing like they've had yeah. they've worked in not really agile and then they don't like agile Yep. Right. So so some of it for us, too, is about being contextually um, strong in principles and strong in our practices, but a little less opinionated about what we call them and, and exactly. how we frame them. Like we're we're learning and and maturing ideas every time someone. Unfortunately, it's like the virus. Right. Every time someone adopts one of these practices, then it mutates somewhat. It changes exactly. and, it, and it grows and it becomes stronger. And so um, so that's another linear and kind of concrete way that we like to have absolutes. Yes or no. Right or wrong. This is what we yeah. do. This is what we don't do. And we don't. I am a very I do. I, I think my, my job is very hard and I think mm. it requires a tremendous amount of self-discipline and, yeah. um, and a lot of work. Um, but it's also can be very fluid and flexible. And I think that's true in educating ourselves about anything. Like I'm definitely yeah. not, um, someone once said it was on Twitter. Mm. They, it was unstructured learning is a complete waste of time. Like it's not like, what, <laughs> how, who, how do you get through a day without any unstructured learn? Like we, like yeah. we're constantly unstructured learning, but exactly. at the same time, structured practices are good. So what is, what's that balance between just enough structure in order to then be able to discover? And I think that's what an architect helps to do, right? It yeah. helps to create just enough structure for what we're building so that, um, and with people building it, not off on their own, but with people building it, just enough structure. And that structure is flexible enough so yeah. that it can some can change and some cannot. And you're clear about what you're marrying and what you're dating in terms of the ideas that you're that you're that this this has, but also creates a space to play in. And yeah. a space for for ownership of that and a reliance on other people's expertise. So in in the work that I do now, the um, the moving pieces, especially so AWS is a great example, like every three seconds, there's a new tool, like yeah. some, something, a better way. And there's no way for me, at least I've not found a way to be the expert on all of that all the time exactly but i don't have to be because i work with brilliant people who know their shit like they yeah. even know it so it's okay for me to be wrong i'm usually right about things like structure and patterns but yeah. i won't necessarily know the best approach but i've got five other people it working with me to figure exactly. out together the best approach. So I don't have to know. I just have to know enough to make sure that we're maintaining integrity and conceptual integrity across the system. And that we're asking the right kinds of questions about the type of patterns that will make a system, um, uh, like feedback loops will make a system grow. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't have to be the smartest person in the room or the most expert on this particular software or that particular software because it would hold everyone back if we were limited by only what I know. Yeah. Um, and also that wouldn't be interesting to me. No. Like, I think it's... I, uh, I do this. I'm pleased. No worries. I think it's a, it's a strange comfort that you get from realizing that, right? That you actually, you don't have to know everything. It's fine to say, 
I don't know, but we can figure it out. Or I don't know, but I know he knows. So as a team, we can figure it out, right? It's very comfortable because then all of a sudden, those closed doors that you're standing in front of, they get opened up, right? And you have way more options because you have that, those people around you, those people that you can learn from uh, and those people together with, you can execute, basically. I uh, I really love this conversation. It kind of went went all over the place, but I love the route that it took. Uh, yeah. I want to thank you for yeah, coming on, Diana. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a little bit of a lag, I think, and I keep interrupting no you worries. and I apologize for that. <laughs> no worries. I wanted to say I, I want to thank you for coming on because uh, oh, I had well, a lot of fun. Oh, well, thank you. It's very, I guess, the, the last thought about this, right? Because I think we've landed in the exact right place. And it's the secret truth for me. The yeah. teams that are really good at what you and I have just talked about, we deliver a lot more faster. Exactly. Like we've actually also been the most successful at doing what we're doing teams. And the ones that really struggle with this are not haven't just been painful, but we also get very little done. So yeah. in my secret heart of hearts, because I actually really like building things, I'm like, but this is what works fundamentally, yeah. like that get out of our own way. So I like that we landed there, <laughs> like effectiveness. We came from abstract and right back to this is actually just how to write code, like how yeah. to deliver products or whatever it is we're building. Yeah. Exactly. I, uh, I love the route that it took. Again, I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, I'm going to put all Diana's socials in the description below. Uh, and with that being said, thank you so much again. We'll see you on the next one. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening, everyone. If you like the episode and want to support the show, don't forget to leave a rating. Better yet, share the episode with a friend. Let us know in the comment section below what you want to hear and we'll make it happen. Cheers.